This is episode 124 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. Wally, there is a lot going on this week, or a lot that went on this week. Notably, uh, we had a vote in the Bernalillo County Commission last Tuesday on mandatory paid leave paid time off and unsurprisingly it went through there were some changes made to it uh, but the I guess most interesting thing about what happened in Bernalillo County is what happened next with already two Albuquerque City councilors proposing uh, their own or at least talking about proposing their own paid leave uh, ordinance so I uh, Let's let's do the talk of the past. What happened with mandatory uh, mandatory leave at the county? And pardon me, dear listeners, if I mistakenly call it sick leave. I know it is paid leave, but it uh, it does slide off the tongue there as sick leave sometimes. So uh, the paid leave it it passed three to two. Yes, and uh, not necessarily surprising. But there were a lot of amendments that, I don't know, you could call it, uh, what is the word, polite word, uh, polishing a not so pretty rock. So uh, putting lipstick on a pig. There you go. Thank you. Better, better, better. Um, Yeah. So a lot of a lot of amendments uh, to the point where maybe some of the counselors heard some of the concerns. But on balance, I still think it's a uh, hodgepodge of uh, conflicting uh, goals and objectives and very difficult and it may not be the end of it because this may grow because we have to have consistency in these things even though uh jurisdictions like the uh city of albuquerque and bernalillo county never seem to bother having consistency when it comes to things like uh minimum wage when no one else has it but when it's going the other way consistency seems like that is a stated goal so we'll see what happens with that but this won't be the end of it it doesn't look like no doubt and uh, a few amendments to discuss first and foremost this law as passed by the county in the unincorporated areas only takes effect on July the 1st of 2020 so it is kind of a a slow burn here in terms of when this policy takes effect. There was an administrative process that was added to this uh, entire situation. So you're not going directly to the courts. Uh, Although after 180 days of this, uh, a sick leave or leave complaint being tied up, uh, then you do go to court. So, uh, you know, could be a stalling tactic or avenue for that kind of behavior uh, if you have people of ill will on one side uh, trying to use this process. And, uh, you know, there's a tiering situation with regard to how the paid leave takes place. And if you're in a smaller business, uh, that's all well and good. But the problem with this proposal uh, that ultimately became the law in Bernalillo County is that small, small businesses, uh, as small as three workers, will be held responsible for some very complicated uh, record keeping and some very challenging new requirements foisted on them by Bernalillo County Commission. Now, uh, the vote was three to two. That is uh, three votes in support. Two opposed, of course, uh, Lonnie Talbert's the lone Republican, and he held firm and did not vote for it. Uh, Piscotti also voted against it. Uh, and, and I think it makes sense. I'm not going to say it was coordinated ahead of time, but I think it's reasonable to uh, know, you know, reasonable the way it panned out and that Piscotti may personally support uh, mandatory leave, but... She represents a relatively conservative district in the East Mountains predominantly. And I, I, I think she wants to get reelected. And uh, she took a, a vote that she didn't have to you know, support the, the leave in order for it to pass. It passed three to two, uh, thanks to two hardcore supporters, Maggie Hart-Stebbins and Debbie O'Malley. 
Uh, the third vote came from Stephen Michael Quezada, who runs, uh, who's in the South Valley. And of course, the South Valley, if he gets challenged, it is going to come from the left, not the right, whereas Piscotti comes from the uh, right, not the left. So she was given or freed to vote whichever way she wanted to, and she voted against it. But I don't think that means that she's an opponent of this kind of, uh, kind of mandate or policy. Yeah, you never know. It's one of those politics is strange. And when it comes to issues like this, uh, I've heard speculation both ways that she actually uh, saw the light and was against it. And uh, certainly that could have happened that she did not like the uh, did not like the ordinance and knew what it was going to do to the businesses in her district. The other was that they knew they had the three votes. So uh, the other uh, commissioner said, hey, we'll give you a pass. You can vote against it. It's going to pass anyway, and you'll look like you're really standing up for what your co- constituents want, and it'll still help push uh, this forward. So, you know, who knows? You never, it, you'll, you can never uh, definitively tell on issues like that, but uh, politics is a strange game anywhere, and in New Mexico, uh, things like that uh, seemingly happen quite often, so I think that's why uh, people at least consider it. I am not generally a cynical person, but I am, with regard to politicians, I am very cynical. So just take that for what it's worth. Now we move on to the city and the two-headed monster of the apocalypse, i.e. Isaac Benton and Pat Davis, uh, city councilors, who if there's a bad public policy out there, they will be the first in line to jump on board with it. Of course, they are now uh, pushing this at the city and you know, the opponents of Bernalillo County taking action uh, often cited the fact that less than two years ago, voters in Albuquerque voted this uh, sick leave policy down, uh, and that was sick leave. Now we're turning into a different kind of leave. But if you have votes often enough, you can change uh, a detail here and there and vote on basically the same concept. And of course, Davis and Benton are eager to support all manner of bigger government. Uh, The question, I think, at this point is not if they'll do it, because they will. Uh, It is, will it pass? And I suspect that it will, uh, given the makeup of Albuquerque City Council. The real question is, will the Albuquerque City Council be willing to put their egos aside and put something forth that actually mirror image reflects what Bernalillo County passed in order to mitigate that very real complexity issue. Because now if you have businesses in multiple jurisdictions, you're going to have enough complexity with compliance already. Are they going to just pass what Bernalillo County passed so that businesses don't have to comply with two very distinct and different paid leave ordinances. Uh, Let me put my Karnak the Magnificent hat on, uh, the old Johnny Carson character. uh, For you millennials, uh, just basically (laughs) the swami of prognostication. And I will say, no way. They will not be able to contain themselves. They will make it different. They will go further, even though, quote unquote, consistency is what they desire. Um, I just don't think there's enough for the national progressive forces that really are pushing these in local jurisdictions in that Bernalillo County to make them happy. So, you know, whether they get to the same place or not, I'm not sure, but I have a feeling they will propose a much different ordinance of it than the one that was passed by Bernalillo County. Well, and not the game theory that's too far out in <laughs> advance, Wally, but you know, we're, we're doing it for a reason. If that were to happen, if, if the County or the city were to pass something, pretty different from what the county did. I think that's where you get businesses lining up in Santa Fe to tell them pass something in the legislature, but it's got to be preempted and uh, preempting local governments. And that, that could even be in hopefully neither Pat Davis nor Isaac Benton listen to this because they'll probably make it as convoluted as possible at the city level in order to spur that exact behavior because as of right now, we're just talking about local businesses. Now it is the biggest metro in the area, but you know, Sandoval County is sitting right now, Rio Rancho is sitting right now saying, come on over. Uh, we don't have the minimum wage increases you have. We don't have the, the vast array of bad policies, bag bans, and all these other things for you to deal with. Come do business in Sandoval and 
Rio Rancho. But if if you got the entire business community of Bernalillo County and Albuquerque on board with uh, uh, doing something on paid sick leave, I think uh, you might get that through the entire legislature. And, uh, you know, th- the critical thing would have to be a preemption. But, uh, of course, we know that they preempt right to work. I don't know that they'll preempt sick leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it is interesting. Uh, things that are for less government and limited government, those are inappropriate for preemption at the state level, seemingly. Although, you know, this whole preemption issue is, uh, it's been selectively invoked on both sides of the aisle over the years. So if, uh, if it's something that you think you can do better at Santa Fe than you can with the local, uh, legislative body, then people definitely try preemption. And uh, in cases like uh, minimum wage until recently, uh, it's gone the other way. So uh, yeah, I think in uh, to just follow along with your game theory, I think the game is already afoot and we will see lots of uh, strategies and uh, tactics in place. And uh, I have heard already that there are state legislators that are already talking about uh, uh, statewide with potentially preempting other local ordinances because this is more government therefore that's good right and uh july 1st though of course with the county not going into effect until you know basically uh 11 months from now uh 10 months from now that gives plenty of time for albuquerque city council to pass something uh, maybe even taking effect before the counties which would be an odd little situation but uh, it's all odd. It's all very strange. And uh, uh, we'll keep on it and keep tracking things and keep battling uh, the city council now in this case. So uh, moving on now to public education and specifically our new secretary of the public education department, Ryan Stewart. Journal did a nice profile on this uh, individual and he's a young man. I hate, I hate to start using the term young man for anybody, (laughs) anybody, but uh, a nice young man's anybody uh, two years younger than you or more. So, well, he's, he's (laughs) younger than me by more than two years. He's 38, uh, Mm. very highly qualified uh, guy, at least credentials wise degrees from uh, Stanford and Harvard. Uh, Interestingly enough, of course, living in Philadelphia, he is out of state. So uh, I'm sure the Democrats will take, just as hostile of stances as they took against uh, Hannah Scandera for ha- her being from out of state. But uh, hopefully not. I actually hope this gentleman uh, succeeds and does a good job. But uh, what I w- noticed in that journal article is that uh, this gentleman has his nine-year-old, which I have a nine-year-old as well, a child in a private Quaker school. And you might think Quaker schools, that's a that's a rare thing. Well, it is a rare bird indeed in New Mexico, not historically a very strong place for Quakers, but Philadelphia is kind of the hotbed, at least historically speaking in this country. And they have three Quaker schools by my count. Uh, I thought it was interesting, you know, a guy coming in to head up the PED, public education department in New Mexico. He's got his child in a private school, uh, exercising that school choice that we all want to see happen around this particular state and hopefully he'll advocate for it. But, uh, the, the price tag of these Quaker schools is quite significant. Uh, two of the three were $30,000 annually for, uh, a child to go to school there in the fourth grade. One was $16,000. That's the, the low rent, uh, private Quaker school up in Philadelphia. And it, this kind of thing isn't meant to criticize or to disparage Mr. Dr. Stewart. He uh, you know, comes here. He's trying to do the right thing for our state, I hope. And uh, I just hope that he is a voice for choice, a vo- voice for educational freedom that he has clearly exercised. And uh, you know, it, it's something that we all should have access to in New Mexico, not just people can afford uh, the private schools here, which there's none that I can think of that cost over $30,000 in New Mexico. Uh, 16,000 is, is getting towards the top end, but you can find a few private schools around New Mexico, uh, in the K-12, uh, space that are a little higher than $16,000. But, uh, boy, it shouldn't be about being able to write a big check to, uh, 
uh, a school to be able to send your kid to a school that's high performing, got teachers that care and that is safe. And uh, unfortunately, that is not the case for too many children in the state of New Mexico. Well, Mr. Stewart, in his previous role, was a level above just public education. He was a broader educational advocate. And I do think at some level, it could be seen as a positive that his goal in general is quality education. And uh, where uh, that may or may not be existing in the public system, to have that openness to the private system is uh, probably a good thing. And to your point, uh, the way the tax system works in New Mexico, if you have kids in school, you're paying for their public education, even if they don't utilize that. And everyone else, whether they have kids or not, that's it's not a uh, just pay for those who uh, benefit. But yes, this could be a positive uh, for the school choice movement. And uh, the fact that maybe his commitment is so strong that it is uh, can put a little uh, pressure and heat in the reform category where it's badly needed in some places in the public system in New Mexico. Yeah, and of course, his number one adversary, if he chooses to support choice, which is not, not a done deal, it's by no means proven at this point, uh, it'll be the unions. The unions have a stranglehold in, on certainly Michelle Lujan Grisham's policies. Uh, she has definitely been taking her cues and nominating people with heavy union backgrounds, which to her credit, though, uh, her prior uh, secretary, Karen Trujillo, I did not get a strong union vibe from her, nor have I gotten it from Dr. Stewart. So maybe there is at least a, a desire to reach beyond some of those hardline uh, opponents of choice in the Lujan Grisham administration. But only time will tell, and we will definitely be tracking him, encouraging him, and uh, trying to move the ball forward to give more students, not just uh, you know children of wealthy folks, uh, the ability to choose their own schools. And it, it's worth noting that uh, uh, a new poll, new survey from the University of Chicago, looks at specifically millennials. So these are folks younger than, you know, born in 1981 or younger, really young folks, although Stewart is actually right at the cutting edge of that group, the leading edge. Uh, Among African Americans, 79% support vouchers for private schools uh, so 79, 79% of African-American millennials support uh, vouchers for uh, low-income students to get out of the failing public schools. And uh, that number is 76% for, uh, or actually 77%, I'm sorry, for Latinos. So uh, strong support among these various minority groups. Of course, New Mexico is a majority <coughs> minority state uh heavy Latin American presence, so, uh, although the, the specifics differ upon uh, you know, closer inspection. But the uh, uh, minorities are the group that are most negatively impacted by failing schools and having some kind of life raft escape route out of those schools is absolutely critical. You can find more on this post at errorsofenchantment.com along with uh, some other polling data about charter schools. And you'd think vouchers would be a harder sell than charter schools, but actually uh, among these various groups, vouchers perform better. So I think there's a strong case to be made that New Mexico really needs to get in the game of having some non-government alternative. And charter schools are wonderful, but uh, we need some non-government alternatives to the traditional public schools. Yeah, and that is a, a very is interesting, uh, interesting survey, interesting uh, set of polling data. And uh, as you alluded to, uh, there is probably uh, in many communities, although New Mexico tends to always be a little different than others, uh, uh, certain African American Latino populations are, as you uh, as you said, hurt by the inner city schools, by public schools with no choice. And they know that. And that's a fantastic, uh, uh, that's a fantastic, uh, insight is that, yeah, they want good education. Everyone's wants good education for their children. And when they're not getting it, they are willing to consider other modes of receiving that. Um, that's what you would expect. Uh, but th- 
the policies don't necessarily always follow quickly with that, particularly in our state. We'll have to see uh, whether we're going to shut down all kind of alternative educational and all it'll be all in for the uh, government controlled schools or will there be more opportunities over time here in New Mexico. And uh, a notable fact also in this data is that white uh, respondents support school choice, whether vouchers or charter schools at lower rates than uh, minority groups, including Asian Americans, not just Latinos and African Americans. So um, I think this is one of those areas, uh, attention Republican listeners, especially candidates, you can reach out beyond your traditional base by uh, ch- uh, going into school choice and making that a very important part of your efforts. And I, I think that is one where you can challenge uh, the Democrats who so often speak a great game, we're going to spend more money uh, to come up with alternatives that are outside the traditional system. But uh, very rarely are they the Democrat candidates willing to buck the union supporters financially and uh, political muscle uh, to actually do something non-traditional in the area of education. Yeah, I just want to say that that the previous message was not subliminal. It was just out there. And yeah, that is a, that is a excellent point that, uh, this trend, this, uh, likely transcends party politics very broadly. And it's a, a hugely important issue. You know, I'm not sure, uh, other than safety, uh, of your children, education, you know, those are, those two go hand in hand. They're both important issues that every, every family cares about. Yep. And, uh, you know, we're kind of doing a potpourri this week, but we take the news as it comes. And, you know, Paul Krebs has been a very bad boy. At least it seems like that. A grand jury indicted him of what they believe to be the behaviors of uh, someone who's been very naughty. Uh, $25,000 of New Mexico tax dollars that he spent. And uh, without getting into all the ins and outs of what Mr. Krebs is alleged to have done, uh, the fact is, is that major college athletics as it stands today and the taxpayer subsidized institutes of higher learning, it really does not make a lot of sense from a, a fit perspective. And I know, Wally, you're a faithful Aggie fan, uh, a lot of Lobos out there, but the idea that an institution that is trying to field competitive major athletic teams, raise the kind of money that is required to put those events on and fund all those scholarships, et cetera, do so uh, alongside or often intermingled with a taxpayer-financed institution that's also getting fee payments from students who may or may not be inclined to actually support those programs. It is a very fraught proposition and uh, a previous guest on our show daniel libet of the new mexico fishbowl has done an excellent job watchdogging on uh, unm athletics and specifically paul krebs and his uh, ethical lapses but without criticizing krebs and he hasn't been convicted of anything yet never it, convicted it, not yet okay <laughs> it is just a real problem that needs to be discussed and highlighted. And I'm not sure that there's any way around it, but in New Mexico, uh, we're, we're seeing this situation play out with Mr. Krebs and his legal woes. Well, you know, if you were to start from scratch, you know, so-called greenfield approach to higher education, um, I'm not sure you would ever, ever get to the point where you had athletics and academics together be, making sense. Certainly how not it's turned out. The so, major business, yeah. like multi-billion dollar enterprise yeah. that we have in major college football and basketball. Yeah, sure. you know, maybe division three, no scholarships, much more back how it was, you know, uh, in the old days. But yeah, how it's developed. And uh, it, is a, it is a huge thing that I think will be difficult to overcome. Uh, my father was a small college, a NAIA, and then Division II college basketball coach. And even as a high school kid who was certainly not the greatest strategic thinker, it's like, huh, 
why do colleges have basketball teams? You know, what's the logic for that? So uh, the, it's an important issue. And then in a place like New Mexico where the athletics has struggled and the finances have struggled and we're in a situation uh, where uh, we've talked before on the podcast, there's an oversupply of education uh, in New Mexico and potentially overspending there may need to be a right sizing of that and then just throw athletics into the mix and uh it makes for a very untenable situation and makes a uh, what's otherwise going to be very difficult maybe even next to impossible to make some progress until things re- get really really bad and uh you know, interestingly enough i just saw this article from Mylan Simonich of the Santa Fe, New Mexican, someone who I don't particularly get along with or have a lot in common with policy-wise, but he writes in his ringside seat column, Alabama Irish set to prey on New Mexico teams. And I guess this college football season, uh, and I'm kind of referencing our merge the Aggie and Lobo (laughs) football team uh, discussion of a of several months ago. So that's which, getting national attention, in other words. <laughs> well, this is this is from the New Mexican, but you can bet that when Alabama feasts on the, the Aggies and the Irish take on the, the Lobos, you know, Simonich is basically saying, look, this is, you know, this whole idea of college athletics is theoretically to help market and raise attention and awareness about these uh, institutes of higher learning, et cetera. But, you know, losing a football game, whether it's on TV or not, uh, 72 to zero does not lead young people to automatically say, you know, those guys have just got their butts kicked by 70 points in football. I think I want to go to that school. Uh, it, it's, it's a very fraught, fraught and problematic thing. I, the Rio Grande Foundation, if nothing else, we're about deliberate uh, thought of – our actions and why are we doing what we're doing to get to what result? Uh, and there's just something wrong with the football situation at the two major universities in New Mexico. You know, whether you think they should be merged, eliminated, maybe the extra money should be uh, part of it should be dumped into getting better basketball programs given back to the students or the taxpayers. I don't know. I just don't think that, uh, going in to take on University of Alabama or Notre Dame is going to be a very auspicious day for either either of our colleges here. You know, when you bring up uh, just a, an interesting detail is the reason that uh, schools like New Mexico State and uh, UNM will play these big schools where they get a tremendous shellacking is they get a tremendously big payday because those big programs need somebody to play early on. It's uh, been derisively called uh, supplying the butt for the butt kicking, but a check is involved coming back to the school. And, uh, you know, this is one of those where uh, definitely the Aggies and the Lobos, particularly in football, are certainly not in the first, second, or third tier of Division One. They are way down there, and what they have to do just to make money to survive is not very palatable. And, uh, you know, you have to go back a long, long way uh, until you see the heyday of of those uh, two football programs. Certainly not cheering against them. Uh, Also, it's good when they play each other. You know one of them's likely to win. The worst thing that can happen is a tie. But, yeah, there are problems with athletics nationwide. And when they're in schools like New Mexico State, University of New Mexico, they're just amplified. Now, uh while we're going to do something a little different here, uh, the Albuquerque Journal editorial pages have uh, recently had a spate of uh, columns, none of them from us at the Rio Grande Foundation. We've already made our views very clear on the Energy Transition Act. But um, there was, well, one column just in the last day or so, which seemed to imply it was a woman out of Idaho, who evidently had experience in New Mexico and uh, had met a Trump gentleman wearing a MAGA hat in a in a store or something, and uh, you know he was asking about the garbage coming across the border. Made it clear it's not talking about people; he's talking about drugs. And she proceeds to lecture him, apparently on lecture us at least on the real garbage is the fossil fuels and the. Uh, 
environmental devastation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the one interesting thing that was I could take away from that column was that she seemed to conflate zero carbon emissions in electricity with uh, oil and gas. And I've heard more than one person say, well, we're supposed to be at zero carbon emissions by 2040. What does that mean for oil and gas? The, it means nothing yeah. in the Energy Transition Act. That's regulated electric, oh, well, and unregulated for that matter, electric generation. It has nothing to do with uh, putting unleaded gasoline in your car or diesel in your uh, 18-wheeler or container ship, which, of course, we don't have. But, yeah, they have nothing to do with each other. Right. But I've heard this from multiple people, and she even mentioned, well, Namoga, New Mexico Oil and Gas Association, did not... Uh, lobby against the Energy Transition Act. Well, you could argue that the Namoga uh, could have lobbied in favor of, say, natural gas being used uh, as a replacement for the coal-fired power plant. I think that would have been a legitimate thing for them. But what she fails to understand is that New Mexico Oil and Gas Association and other pro-industry groups do not have the time, the resources, or the ability to sway legislators all across these various issues. She, the, the left inherently assumes that uh, these industry associations just elect the candidates and they get to rule the roost. The reality could not be farther from the <laughs> truth. And even if Namoga uh, thought that natural gas would be a great replacement for coal, which I agree with that statement, uh, the fact is, is that they are just not going to go that far, that direction for a variety of political reasons, but mostly because they are defending the producers of those products from regulatory harm, not going out and finding new dragons to slay uh, on the usage front. Yeah, and it is ironic that, and we've already seen it in PM's proposals, we're getting rid of coal and we're going to get to carbon free. And the first thing we need to do is build some natural gas fired power plants, because guess what? Wind, solar, and batteries don't work today. And so we're betting on this hypothetical future. And so uh, first to your point, yes, uh, I don't think all business organizations necessarily are even aware of, much less can effectively uh, advocate across all things. And in this case, it's not even clear that the Energy Transition Act might even be better for natural gas producers, at least in the short term. So... That is true, yeah. yeah. Whether natural gas is the long-term replacement or not is still uh, open to determination. There's a lot of different steps there uh, on that issue. And, you know, like I said, Namoga was, I'm sure, up to their ears and bad legislation throughout this uh, past 2019 session. They, they're not going to be able to divert that much attention to uh, ensuring that the replacement for coal is, is natural gas. The market will work itself out, and that's kind of, uh, I assume, their philosophy as it is ours. Uh, now, three op-eds appeared in the same day, and we're going to really go lightning round on these. One was written by a coalition of unions and environmental groups. PRC could derail win-win-win energy deal. And it's not so interesting what they wrote because they didn't actually make any arguments. But the fact that you have big labor, Brian Condit and his uh, construction trades group with uh, environmental groups, uh, it's a surprising to an extent alliance because uh, you would think people that build things would be directly against the people who don't want anything built, but uh, that maybe oversimplifies it. Think of it through the left-wing political spectrum. And this was a top priority for Michelle Lujan Grisham. Therefore, it's a top priority for interest groups on that side of the aisle. And the unions are not going to let a good opportunity to uh, align themselves for the political benefit of the uh, that group of folks, including but not limited to the governor, go without uh, helping her out in any way they can. Well, and we've seen nationally the trade unions have, there's been a bit more shift away from the environmental left part of the Democratic Party, but not here in New Mexico yet. Well, and when the left controls the entire political structure, uh, yeah. you're going to make your bed and find that. But you're, you're specifically talking, I believe, about Keystone XL pipeline. For example. For yes. example, a lot of these pipelines are built with union uh, labor and environmentalists don't like pipelines, along with everything else about uh, fossil fuels. 
So there has been that conflict, but not as much here. Uh, now, uh, a, a guy who does not share Rio Grande Foundation's opinion on the Energy Transition Act, in fact, supports large swaths of it, uh, John Boyd, identified as uh, Albuquerque, and uh, says Albuquerque senator has P&Ms, not ratepayers, back. So he calls Jacob Candelaria the sponsor of the Energy Transition Act, uh, the senator from P&M, which definitely is good <laughs> enough for a chuckle when I saw that one, Wally. Yes, I chuckled as well. I was uh, somewhat surprised the Albuquerque Journal let that pass their editorial process. But yes, there's a, a lot of emotion out there on this Energy Transition Act. And as you alluded to, people don't even know what it means and what is implied. And uh, the other issue that I've been saying for a long time is there are no price protections inherent in the Energy Transition Act. Uh, those that uh, were lobbying hard for it in, in Santa Fe always said it would reduce costs. The And I've said this uh, once and I'll say it many more times. It does reduce cost hypothetically compared to another hypothetical cost increase curve. That doesn't mean that prices will not go up. And we, you know, when, if and when that happens, I do think that we will be in for a, really that's where the rubber is going to meet the road in New Mexico because uh, when everyone's arguing about hypotheticals, uh, it's a little bit, you know, it's like, what difference does it make? But once you're starting to say, okay, what are we really using to generate electricity and how much is it costing the consumers who utilize that energy? That's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And uh, this guy, as I said, uh, he's an attorney uh, here in Albuquerque. I think he's reading from what I would say the PRC uh, songbook, if you will, uh, which is largely supportive of uh, the ETA and PNM, but not the stranded assets. And, you know, what is that utility? What is that power plant uh, worth? How much is it going to cost to decommission it? Those kinds of issues uh, call, cause Mr. Boyd to uh, take a pretty direct shot at uh, Senator Candelaria and his sponsorship of the Energy Transition Act. Finally, uh, and I got some surprise responses on this one as well. Uh, so, uh, clean energy isn't the one putting New Mexico in the dark, written by Sherman McCorkle of the Albuquerque Chamber. Now, if you were there as I was during the debate on this, you would have known that the Albuquerque uh, Chamber of Commerce joined alongside the radical environmentalist and the unions and PNM in supporting the Energy Transition Act. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise to see them out there editorializing and supporting this legislation. Now, uh, I don't know what the finances of the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce are, but I know that PNM has a bigger presence on the Albuquerque Chamber, more involved, more money, uh, more sponsorship of rooms and facilities down there than any other uh, business I've ever seen. Uh, and they're the major publicly traded company in the state of New Mexico. So they pull a lot of weight when it comes to groups like the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce. So not a surprise, but I think folks often see, uh, you know, business as conservative equals good and other groups as bad equals, I mean, I'm talking about broadly speaking, our side, so to speak, you know, the uh, folks often draw these lines when in reality, it is a much more complicated uh, web in terms of who's getting what and why are they taking positions that they do. And it's kind of the way politics works. Yes, and uh, this to this point, uh, the amount of economics and, oh, shall we say science that is inherent in the debate of the Energy Transition Act, you know, pales at a ratio of 10 or 20 to 1 to just brute force politics. Exactly, yeah. It's a, uh, a very complicated policy issue on its front, but it's also a very uh, convoluted situation in terms of the interest groups and who's voting which way or who's supporting which side. Uh, finally, the uh, weekend saw a trip over to Los Altos Park. Um, this is Eubank and I-40. It's the one with a lot of the softball uh, facilities right there. And a lot of homeless, I might also say. And 
you know, my friend uh, came down from out of town, his family, they spent a lot of time over at that park, saw a lot of uh, pretty gross things and uh, just a buildup of stuff and people just sitting, camping out, essentially living in this park. And, uh, you know, the point is, is that Mayor Keller and uh, the administration have a $14 million uh, plan for a shelter. It's going to be on your fall ballots here. Uh, the idea is to build a homeless shelter, but uh, I ask you, the listener, I ask Mayor Keller and anyone on city council, what is going to actually result from the construction of this facility? Are we going to see homeless actually using the facility? What is going to push them into something that's not going to create dirt and filth and danger and crime all across our city and is actually going to involve moving these homeless people, so-called homeless people, into these facilities. Because I haven't seen the kind of enforcement action to get them out of our parks, our communities parks, uh, that make it comfortable for people to come from out of town and sit and watch kids play softball without having a, a you know this disgusting behavior all around them. And uh, it, you would think that the mayor, with all of his emphasis on tourism and uh, spending all this money on a new shelter would be trying as hardest to move these folks into existing facilities where there's space available. But uh, it's not the case. And we're just seeing this homeless situation run rampant in New Mexico, in Albuquerque. Wally. Yes. And uh, my perception is just from people I talk to in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco, Seattle, that we are not quite there yet. But the whole issue of homelessness is so complicated and the rules are such that uh, building facilities doesn't always work because many of the people who are on the streets right now are eligible and could uh, take advantage of existing facilities and they have no desire to. So, you know, you bring up a very good point. Uh, is all hopeless? No, but, you know, there's uh, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union seems to want no rules with regard to the homeless on public spaces and even private spaces trespassing on both. They don't even understand that concept. You have this whole mental health issue. And then what really does happen? You know, uh, uh, not to name names, but uh, there have been mayors of cities in the past that uh, have used the one-way bus ticket to somewhere else as a primary technique to deal with the homeless uh, in the past. Uh, I've gotten on good authority uh, from people on the front lines. I don't think that's necessarily the uh, uh, the right answer, you know, transplanting our problem somewhere else. But also there is a thought, and I heard a, uh, a candidate for city council that said he spent quite a bit of time in the downtown homeless population. And uh, many of those people actually received a one way bus ticket from elsewhere to Albuquerque. And they were sold on how friendly and what a good opportunity for the homeless Albuquerque is. So maybe we're on the receiving end of that, not necessarily on the sending it to elsewhere end. Yeah. I can just make a few comments, you know, with all the environmental initiatives happening at the city level, you know, the solar panels going up, the push for zero carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to just have rampant trash and uh, stuff accumulate in our city parks is not environmentally friendly either. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that I think most people would consider a eyesore or a blight on the landscape. You know, uh, another carbon molecule in the atmosphere isn't going to make that much of a difference. But seeing all this stuff that's clearly left behind by so-called homeless people is a, uh, is a real issue. And we need to see what options are available from other successful cities. You know, there's this mentality here in New Mexico and Albuquerque that everything's so unique that we can't possibly learn any lessons from other places. Well, we see the problems of the Seattle's and the San Francisco's, but you go to Central Park in New York, and I know for a fact that you do not see anything like this kind of homeless situation in New York City. That is a far bigger city with far more homeless people, I'll venture to say, than Albuquerque. What is New York City doing in at least its marquee park that Albuquerque could learn from? Same with Washington, D.C. 
you you don't go to the National Mall and see a bunch of homeless people camping out right next to the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial, whatever it is. Uh, what are they doing? And it's not the city, it's the federal government. But either way, if the federal government's getting away with doing something and forcing on the homeless, you would think we can do the same thing. Just use Washington's doing it and then, you know, see what happens. But yeah. um, more aggressive action is, is required. It is the progressive mentality that is the true problem, I believe. And Tim Keller, San Francisco, Seattle, and so many of these Western cities succumb to that progressive mentality. It's time for somebody with new ideas or at least a spine to get in there and change it. All right, Wally. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast, everyone. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show.